questions. Our first question is, ho, 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 have you really been nice? Or did I just not notice you being naughty? In this question, we're going to talk about how to formulate statistical questions. And we'll talk about a very basic statistical test. And we'll see largely that most of the tests that we talk about fit to the same general pattern. Let's talk about how we formulate a test. And but let's talk about what that test might be and what this all means and how to make it concrete. Let's say we have some data. Remember, when we're talking about our data, we're often talking about not the actual reality of every single instance of something happening, but some sampling of that. We don't have the ability to go and sample, or we don't have the ability to go and survey every single person in the world. We'll sample just a smaller set of them and make conclusions based off of that. If this data represented, for example, temperatures of devices in a data center, and we wanted to see how our work as hardware engineers might be affecting those temperatures, maybe a new cooling paradigm, maybe switching to passive cooling might raise the temperatures, might lower the temperatures, does it have an effect? Maybe distributing the workload might or might not have an effect? Well, sure, these are a, a discrete number of devices in a building that we own. But are we really going to get all of those temperature measurements? Is that effective? Is that something that we can actually do? Or is it the case where we could make conclusions by looking at a subset of that data? But if we look at a subset of that data, we immediately see the problem. Here you can see x's, y's, and z's, which are subsets, sampling of some population. And currently, I'm sampling 99% of the population. And you can see our basic statistics, the mean, the variance, the skew, and the kurtosis, are largely in line with each other. But if I don't have the ability to look at 99% of the population, I can only look at 50% of the population, you'll start to see that we're very sensitive to how we sample. Now, the means are not quite as close to each other. And so depending on how we sampled, we might get one impression or another. And as we start looking at perhaps more realistic samplings, like 25% or 1%, these values begin to diverge. Our goal with the statistical test is to say, given data, which I know is not a complete view of the entire population, but just a view of the sample. What can I say with what confidence about what the population looks like? In fact, most of the time when I define these hypotheses, I'm defining these hypotheses and their corresponding test statistics about the overall population based off of some subset, some view of the population. I want to share with you just a little bit of terminology. And it's terminology you've seen before. It's terminology you've heard before. It's terminology we'll use as we describe these tests. You've heard people say the null hypothesis, which I denote here as H naught. Here, the null hypothesis is usually a hypothesis that I'm making, that I'm trying to prove or disprove, I'm trying to accept or reject. And usually, it corresponds to this was just chance alone, nothing happened, nothing serious. The alternative hypothesis is usually what I'm aiming for. It's usually what I care to see. Did my work actually have a change on this result? I did a session about optimization, and I talked about how we can optimize code. Well, if I change the code and I run it up 10 times in a row and I see that it's faster, is that really faster? Is that just the noise of all the other processes that might be running on my machine? We're usually aiming for the alternative hypothesis, and the way we do that is via something very similar to proof by contradiction. We're aiming to reject the null hypothesis. We construct a hypothesis that says, no, nothing happened, no big deal. These are, these are similar or dissimilar, whatever it is that you didn't want to find. And then we disprove it. We reject the null hypothesis. And so, for example, let's say we have a bunch of data about devices in a data center. Here you can see I have temperature measurements for some devices in a data center, and I have the entire data center, and I have the mean and the standard deviation. And I want to ask, hold on, wait a second. I have the entire population here. Generally, why do I need a hypothesis? I can already answer questions like whether something did or did not have an effect. I can look at the entire population before and the entire population after, and it'll tell me exactly, oh yeah, definitely, the mean and the standard deviation changed. And so, bear in mind, for every one of our examples, what I will show you is a an, a, a complete population representing the entirety of reality, and then I'll sample from that, and we'll pretend that we only have the ability to look at that sample and make judgments based off of that. So let me rewind. Instead of looking at the whole population, let's say that I'm going to sample this population. And let's say that I can sample 99% of this population. That's a lot. Note, when I construct my null hypothesis and I'm rejecting it, there is a certain aspect here, a certain heuristic. I am not proving or disproving the hypothesis, I am rejecting it or accepting it. Because 
For example, if these were temperatures of devices in the data center, and I sampled 99% of them, and the mean was 75, is that what the actual population mean is? Maybe, maybe not. But here you can see for a bunch of devices, I said, they caught on fire, they're hotter than the surface of the sun, they're a million degrees Fahrenheit. It's in the data. And as long as I don't have a complete view of the data, I never really know what might be lurking out there. And so I have to make a judgment. I have to say, well, what's the probability that nothing happened? And at what level am I confident about that probability being so small that I can say, well, you know what? If I looked at 99% of the data and they were all about 75 degrees, in terms of their mean temperature, what's the probability that there's some devices out there lurking at a million degrees? Pretty low. Now, of course, you can think from a reasonable perspective. There are some, some things that I, I don't mention, like for example, what's the probability that a temperature is less than 500 degrees Kelvin? Zero. What's the probability that a temperature, that if we capture the mean and we're only missing one device, that mean could be anything? Well, because the temperature is bounded, then that's probably, we can, we can in some, certain cases say that's zero. But, in general, what we're going to assume is we don't really know what's lurking in that outside data, and so we're going to make a judgment call. And related to that judgment call, there is some additional phraseology that I want to share with you. Bear in mind that accepting or rejecting the null hypothesis is an asymmetrical thing. When you reject the null hypothesis, you say, well, my hypothesis was nothing happened, no big deal, but it's not consistent with the data. So I'm gonna reject that, I'm gonna say something really happened. Rejecting the null hypothesis is a fairly strong statement, but accepting the null hypothesis, failing to reject it, is not that strong of a statement, it's a weak thing. It said, well, the data is consistent with nothing happening, but I don't really know, maybe there's something lurking out there. Related to this, I can make mistakes, and based off of my sampling, I can change how my sampling is, so that I reject the null hypothesis, I accept the null hypothesis, I can tweak those things. And there are circumstances in which I mistakenly reject the null hypothesis. I say, oh yeah, definitely something happened, but nothing really happened. That's a false positive or a type one error. Or I mistakenly accept the null hypothesis. I say, oh, definitely something happened, but nothing really happened. That would be a false negative error. The way that I typically go about doing this is maybe a little bit ad hoc from the perspectives of some, but what I'll do is I'll assign a level of significance. I'll say, if the probability that the data that I see exists given the null hypothesis is less than 1%, then you know what, that's, that's a good enough threshold for me. You know, probably not the null hypothesis, probably something happened. And I'll assign this alpha parameter a level of significance. I will compute what is called a p-value, a probability. And the probability is, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, what is the probability of seeing the data that I see? If that probability is very low, then probably the null hypothesis isn't true. I've rejected it, I've, and thus, you can say that I've proven my alternative hypothesis by contradiction. Let's see this in practice. Here, I have 1% of my entire population. I'm going to sample it. My null hypothesis is going to be that the population mean is close to 75. So what I'm gonna say is, given my observed data, which happens to have a mean of 77 in my observed data, I'm gonna say, well, in my null hypothesis, maybe no effect happened. The temperature didn't go up, didn't go down. The mean is around 75. And I'm gonna to look to reject that so I can say, oh no, the temperature did go up or it did go down. You know, something that I did on this cooling had an effect. Maybe 75 was the original mean. And now I'm looking to see if it's still that in some, in some scenario after I've done something. When I do that, I can use a statistical test. And a very simple statistical test that I can use is a Z test or a Z test. Here you can see that I'll use stats model stats.waystats Z test, and it gives me a p-value. And the p-value that it gives me is 0.04, so it tells me there's a 4% chance that this data is out there that I'm looking at in the presence of the null hypothesis, in the presence that we're close to the mean, in the presence that nothing really happened. And I might say, you know what, my confidence is about, you know, my tolerance, my threshold is about 5%. If it's less than a 5% probability, probably didn't happen, probably isn't the case. And here you can see I can reject the null hypothesis. One big question is, well, for that alpha parameter, do I need to select it first? 
Probably, because it's a little bit unfair if I look at my p-value and I say, well, how can I make sure that I show an effect? And additionally, you can see there is a little bit of fuzziness here. There's a lot of judgment. What really constitutes a good alpha? What really constitutes a good p-value? There are industry standards, there are values that people just use, but I think that there can be a lot of question as, really? Is that enough of a probability given, for example, the base rate or given, for example, the prevalence of something happening? We will talk about that later, but for now, let's keep it simple and we'll stick to a classical model. There were some assumptions in this test. One of the assumptions that I had was that I know what the standard deviation is, and the standard deviation is around some particular value. And the other assumption for this particular test is that my data is normally distributed. Do you remember we talked about the normal distribution being kind of a big deal? Well, in general, for most of the tests, we're going to assume that the data is normally distributed because it allows these tests to operate in the fashion they do. It allows us to compute these easily. The normal distribution is a big deal, and it comes up a lot. Is it an assumption that I can just make? I don't know. I guess I could appeal to the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem, please tell me that my data is normally distributed. And you can see on faith alone, maybe I can say it is. Is that really sufficient? Is that really rigorous? That remains to be seen. But we'll keep things simple. We'll allow these assumptions just so that we can progress through the process of constructing these tests. Now, what does that z-test really look like? What is it really doing? How is it really computing it? How is it giving me the ability to say, something happened from the data that I see? Well, one way I could formulate the z-test or the z-test is I could allow it to take the significance level and I could just randomly pick a value under. So I'm always seeing a result, so I'm always significant. And this will be great if I'm looking for funding or if I'm looking for a promotion or I'm looking to prove that my work really makes a difference. I could prove anything this way. Probably if I'm looking to do something rigorous, this is not sufficient. And so instead, let's see if we can more formally represent the z-test. Remember, my null hypothesis is that the population mean didn't really change, it's around 75. And I'm looking to prove, or I'm looking to see whether I can prove via contradiction that the population mean might be greater or less than 75. You can see there is some symmetry there. And I'm going to do that without knowledge of the population, only knowledge of my sample. The way I construct the z-test is going to remind you of the z-transform that we talked about. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my sample mean. I am going to subtract from that sample mean the target that I'm looking for. I am going to normalize that. I'm going to divide that by the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. This looks very similar to that z-transform. And now you might see why they have a similar name, or at least a letter. They start with the same letter. When I do that, one question arises, which is, well, here I'm using the population standard deviation. And I said one of my assumptions is that I know the population standard deviation. But notice that this stats model z-test didn't take the population as a parameter. So how did it know what the standard deviation is? Well, it turns out the stats model's z-test isn't quite what we, what we typically say is at least a mathematical formulation of the z-test. Here, what they're doing is using an estimator. They're saying the data is big enough. We'll use an estimator. We'll take the standard deviation of the sample, unbiased by that Bessel's correction, and that's what we're going to do. And so if you look at the output of the z-test, it comes in two forms. The first is what's called the sample statistic, and the second is what's called your p-value. Here, you can see I can compute the same sample statistic as the z-test. This is some statistic that I'm computing, and I'm going to see if that statistic lies within what's called a critical region. The last part of computing this p-value, first part is compute the sample statistic. The second part is identify whether it actually appears in some critical region, identify what the probability of seeing that sample statistic would be. So given this sample statistic, what I'll do is I'll relate it to a standard normal distributions, CDF. And because this is an exact match and there's some symmetry there, I'll multiply this result by 2. And you'll see that I'm matching up my p-value, 0.0449, in my z-test against my manually constructed one. Now, there's a little bit behind the scenes that stats models are doing that makes this not quite the z-test that you typically hear about. But rather than go into those details, which we will cover, what I want to share with you is what the intuition behind this mechanism is. Let's think of this. We assumed the data was normally distributed, which means if we look at the data, it kind of looks 
like that in its PDF. And I've added vertical lines, and those vertical lines indicate the sample statistic. So I've computed a statistic, and I'm going to compare that to my CDF. Now you can see that my sample statistic is actually how far you are away from the mean that I'm looking for, normalized in some fashion. And it's normalized because I'm comparing this against a standard normal distribution. Once I've done that, I can say, you know what? The probability that this thing occurred, and given the null hypothesis, is whatever the area under the curve is on the left-hand side plus the area in the curve on the right-hand side. This curve here tells me what the probability of these, va of these particular values are. These lines here tell me the value that I see when I compute this sample statistic, the, dis the distance from the mean. And if I look at the area here and I look at the area here, that tells me what's the probability of this occurring. That gives me the p-value. Now, computing it directly from the PDF is not as easily, so instead, I'll look at the CDF. And remember, the CDF is my cumulative distribution function. The CDF says, up to any point here, what is the probability of being at that point or lower? So what I've done is I've computed a sample statistic. What is my normalized difference from the mean? I've taken that sample statistic, and I'm going to relate it to the CDF. I'm going to say, well, what is the probability that I saw that value or lower. And because I'm looking at an exact value, so it could be above the mean, it could be below the mean, I'll multiply that to 2. That's where that 2 factor comes in to represent the two lobes of this. This is what's called a two-tailed test. And this is how these pieces fit together. And this is how it fits together with the CDF. I've computed my sample statistic, and then I've looked at some critical region. And I've tried to identify what's the probability I'm in that critical region. And that's given me my p-value. And then I've used that p-value along with a little bit of judgment to determine, yeah, I like this. this. This looks good. This is probably something that happened or didn't happen, thus relating to what I'm trying to prove statistically. And so just to review a little bit of that terminology, in each one of the tests that I'm going to show you, we compute a test statistic. We look at that test statistic within what you might call a rejection region or a critical region. And with that, we're able to determine a p-value, which then allows to determine whether or not we accept or reject that null hypothesis. It is the case this null hypothesis is a little bit backwards. You're kind of trying to disprove the thing that you don't want. And this is one thing that, in some cases, may make it a little bit clumsy to think about. But largely, these classical frequentist statistical formulations are pretty straightforward to compute. There is one other thing that I should mention, but we won't talk about it in too much depth. Just because we see a difference doesn't really mean that that effect was meaningful. Just because we see that the probability of there being an effect, that something changed, that some mean value is what we expected it to be or was not what we expected it to be, we thought the original was supposed to be 75 or we measured that. We did something and then we remeasured. We saw a value that is statistically probably indicating that the new population mean isn't 75. So that means it made it better or it made it worse. Well, but by how much, right? And so we need to talk, in some cases, about the effect size. We talk about how much of an effect happened. Because you can think that, in some cases, we could very clearly prove something. It's not particularly meaningful. There are many different ways to compute the effect size. One such that comes up quite often is Cohen's d. You take the mean of what you're looking at and the mean of what you're looking for, and you divide that by the standard deviation, see how, how many standard deviations. And there's a little bit of guidance for what a d value corresponds to with regards to whether the effect size is very small, small, medium, large, very large. I don't want to go into too much depth with this effect sizes, but I do want to show you, like, who chose large as 0.8? I don't think they proved that mathematically. I think they, OK, feels about right. And so it is very important to understand that when we're dealing with these null hypotheses or the effect size, there is a very large area of judgment. and. Critically, we are making judgments about the reality of the world. So these are very judicious judgments that we have to make.